Thank you, uh, Brother Tony. And uh, good evening, everyone. This is um, it's more like a public lecture. Isn't it? This is supposed to be our public lecture type and not so much a uh, uh, deep in class or that. And um, so uh, not as expository, if you will, of that. So uh, we're talking earlier since the title is Russia's Aggression, a Sign of Christ's Coming. And you probably thought there was going to be some Putin pictures up there for sure. Maybe some tanks and some other things. But it, it would be, uh, what's the right vernacular now? It'd be uh, clickbait, right? I mean, is that title, <laughs> right? Is that, if I got that right? <laughs> It'd be clickbait, that's the title of that. But um, uh, I've had quite a bit of time to look at this. And, you know, what, you know, what is it that you would want to, what could I say that I want you to go away with? And from a lecture standpoint, so uh, it was Brother Andrew, and I'm going to give him the credit for it, because he said, well, then pretend that you're speaking to your two daughters. And so my two daughters are at home on Zoom or whatever with their, uh, with my wife, so I'm going to pretend that I'm talking to them at a level that they can uh, understand and what I would want them uh, to get out at looking at Russia's aggression. Is that a, a sign of Christ's coming? And so we have to say, well, where do we get these, uh, this information? And if you were uh, coming from the outside and you're a lecture from the public, you'd be going, Russia, a sign of Christ coming. What are you guys, where, where are you getting that from? Right? You might say, like, I can't even find Russia in the Bible, right? I look, look, I put it on Google. I use some free software. I just I looked it up. Russia's not even mentioned in the Bible, right? So like, I'm not aware of any, uh, any translation that... Uh, Puts where we'll be looking at uh, tonight in Ezekiel, uh, where that might be. But we would um, say somehow that the way this is uh, working out, you know, Russia's moving in its forces, its armies, its navy, uh, you know, or whatever you want to call somehow everything, something is going on, would be somehow be a sign of, of Christ's return. And I'd say that it's a type of, of, of Christ's return that uh, would uh, get us there. And so where do we get our information from? And I'd like to uh, uh, probably go here probably too much in our public lectures, but the first place I'd like you to go, and, I, and I'd love it if you would turn with me in, in your own Bibles, because that's how you're able to uh, put that up. That's what I'd want my two daughters at home to do, look at it in their own Bibles, in their own translation, in their own version, as we feel that it doesn't matter what translation or version you're using, that the truth from, from wherever thing will come out. There are some places where it's a little, some words and things can be a little funky, but no matter what it is, as long as it's a, a translation and not a paraphrase, because there are a couple of paraphrases, but that you will be fine. You will have that. So one of those places we get from and where we say thing is to look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. This is the Apostle Paul speaking to Timothy as he is, as he would be his son, right? And Timothy was Paul's son in the truth, that he had taken uh, Timothy as a young man. Uh, it seemed that, that uh, possibly that um, Timothy's father was not alive, if you can go that far, or that, or that his father was a Greek. And so Timothy needed some schooling from someone to take him under his, his shoulder somewhat, although his mother was uh, uh, a Hebrew, a Jew. But so the Apostle Paul speaking to Timothy and reminding him in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and I'm going to cut in at verse 15. And at that, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus, that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and for reproof and for correction and for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And so we just put it right out there that we get our information from the word of God, and you can too. And you will go through this sort of process of it. It means that you will be corrected. You make mistakes, you read from the word, you find, oh, 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 that doesn't seem to fit. You got you to gotta make, you, gotta you will be uh, admonished, as it were. And the idea of being perfect is not that you're perfectly and you do nothing wrong, because that's the way uh, 
a modern definition of perfect is. But back when uh, 1611, King James perfect meant mature, uh, uh, a journeyman, not, not a trainer, but somebody who's, you know, understands that he's going to go through those processes. Doesn't mean that they'd be perfect because they still need instruction. They still need correction and they still get admonished in that way. And even it's, it's picked up a little bit twice there at the end. The man of God will be mature and thoroughly mature in all his works. Spiritually mature. I go about that. That's, that's the way that works. There's a couple other uh, characters in the Bible who were thought up that way. Abraham, Noah, perfect at all his age. If you can run it, some of you can nod. Yes, those are things. That's, that's what that means. It doesn't mean perfect. I don't make any mistakes uh, along those lines. And so... This is we, where we would start. How about the other one would be, I want you to turn with me, is to uh, Second Peter. Because we're going to be looking at prophecies. And, and Second Peter, and in chapter 1, oh, you want an Old Testament one, this one's a favorite one, is if you want to uh, get your correction from the word, just look at Psalm 119, 176 verses in the King James Version. You will get all the admonishment that you can, hand, that you can handle. <laughs> all, right. all right. So it's not just a New Testament thing. The word, the, word, the Bible is for getting the uh, uh, instruction. And so uh, in that sense. But tonight we're going to be looking at some uh, prophecies. And in particular, we're going to be looking. Uh, so we want to get uh, an establishment of that. And that is from Second Peter, then in chapter 1. And I'm going to cut in at around uh, verse 19, no, right at verse 19. And he says, we have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto that you, you do well that you take heed as a light that shineth in a dark place until the dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. I changed spirit from ghost out of the King James. Or that. And sometimes I'm, uh, lately I've been using you instead of ye. Let's do that right in my mind, just in case you're wondering what's going on. Or that. <laughs> there's a, so there's a few things that we get from there that we have a more sure word of prophecy, and that would indicate in just uh, first reading is that there's been some prophecies that have been fulfilled. <laughs> there's been some prophecies that have been partly fulfilled, and that there's still some prophecies that need fulfilling. <laughs> but we have a more sure word of prophecy because we can tell that some of them have been fulfilled and, and even partially fulfilled. And so one of the ones that we're going to look at uh, tonight is one that's not fulfilled, and it's in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. And, that, and so it's not the only one to look at, but that's where the main where one where we get the uh, Russian part. And it's saying that verse 20 is interesting. It's knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. So again, it's not Dean's interpretation, right? And, and that uh, idea is that you can be able to see uh, do your own homework, if you will. Do your own checking of, uh, within the word and go through the process that the Apostle Paul was telling Timothy and become mature, perfect. <laughs> like that better? You want to be perfect? You can, that? You, can be, you can do that. That's a possibility. In fact, it's a, what you should aspire towards. We, all, all of us should aspire towards that. So, um, not a private interpretation, and that God made sure that we would have the opportunity to look at these prophecies. God moved holy men of old and made sure that they would be around for us. This is an important part. If, you, if you're listening tonight, you've come here, there's probably two, the way to break that up, the title would be two things, Russia's aggression. I don't know if that's a question mark or not or a semicolon, I guess, or I'm not really a good at grammar. The second part might be the, a sign of, uh, what's that, a sign of Christ's uh, return and, you know, with a, a exclamation point, you know, that's the sign of Christ's return. Or, that, or maybe going, uh, is that 
is that a sign of Christ's return like, with a question mark? Is it? Is it something that we should see when we all that? So uh, there's a little bit of, of that going on. And so um, we need to have a look at, at, at what we can. And so what we will do tonight is when we look at things, we will uh, you know, probably shed some lights on some part, but you give you probably more questions than you have of answers over that. Right? And that's the beauty at looking, looking at the word. But we will direct where you can get uh, some of those answers. Now, you're probably wondering why I had uh, Acts chapter 1 uh, read, or maybe you're not. But the idea of Acts chapter 1 is, uh, in its context, is that the apostles uh, are... The disciples are gathered together. It doesn't say exactly who is there. I always say the apostles, but disciples, apostles, I'm not sure who was there. I know who wasn't there, right? Judas wasn't there, right? That's where the, yeah, you can get that he wasn't there. But um, they would say that the, that the disciples were there, assuming that uh, most of the apostles, if not all the apostles, and maybe some others. And the point is that, that while they were while they were there, it says, I'm going to cut in at verse 9. And when he, he is Jesus. And when Jesus had spoken uh, these things, and when they, the disciples, beheld him, he was taken up in a cloud and received out, uh, they received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, and he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, so they'd be the angels. So while he was going up, he had two other men. And then the angels speak, right? Which, verse 11, which also said, you know, you men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which was taken up, up to you, uh, into heaven shall come in like manner as you have seen him go up into heaven. And so this is one of the many places we can say, look, Christ is going to return. It says so right here. It was crystal clear. You don't, it doesn't matter what version you're using, what translation you're using. You can see that they were there and they saw him go up. Or then they're on the, we find out that he's on the Mount of Olives and they're going to see him come back down. And uh, uh, that's what the angels said. And they didn't know that. They didn't know he was going to leave. And they had, still have no idea when he was going to come back. As the times and the seasons, you don't need to know. In fact, it would be at this time that no man knew when Christ was going to return. And, I, and maybe only the only man who would would be the Lord Jesus Christ at this time. And so what they really expected is there in verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked him, Jesus, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And so that's what they expected. He had been resurrected from the dead. They knew exactly who he was. They had touched them and handled them and they, uh, for a number of days. And it was, was seen by, by uh, hundreds of people, if you go through the, uh, through the whole uh, Acts and other parts of the, of the word. And so they knew who he was. And they said, wow, here you are and here we are together. Are you at this time going to set up the kingdom of Israel now that you're here? And he tells them, no, right? I go, and, and he leaves them. And so what their expectation was that they would, he would return and set up the kingdom of Israel. And so that a sign of Christ's return is something that we would all uh, need to go uh, uh, look at and to be with there. And so a uh, part of this kingdom of Israel may or may not be, uh, 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 you may or may not be used to, but it is the same as saying the kingdom of God. It's the same as saying the promises that have been left under to the fathers. And I'm going to want you to turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. And I, you don't need to know this. I have taken my old Bible. I use my new Bible and my old Bible together, and I don't have to turn as many passages. But my old Bible is all hard to get to the passages. It's all sticky. Somebody's hiding Galatians, even though I, even though I know where it is. There it is. Galatians chapter 3. And in its context, it's all about, uh, let's say, the, the promises that made unto the fathers. Uh, uh, quickly, what I would say to you, and, uh, and I've got it uh, highlighted here, that this chapter is about Abraham. It's all the, Abraham is one of the central themes of this chapter. It's not the only theme in the chapter, but he's, he's an anchor 
to the theme of the chapter. And you can tell that because his name comes up like every other verse or so. And he comes up, I have it highlighted, but he comes up in verse 6, verse 7, verse 8, verse 9, verse 14, 16, uh, 18, and verse 29. And so when you go through that, you say, look, how come Abraham is being brought up about this? And what I'm going to say to you is that this might come to us as a shock. Abraham didn't know Israel. I mean, when was Israel Israel? Israel is the name that was given to Jacob after he's coming back as he was midlife, I would say, right? Or like it's hard to get exactly the time. That's more of a long conversation. How old was Jacob before he came back into the land after Laban? Depends on how long he was serving Laban for his wives. And that always gets to be a little, little funky or like that. But it was quite a long time. Abraham had been had died. He didn't know that Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And there's no indication that he would do that. But the kingdom of Israel, the promises that were passed on, Abraham had a son Isaac, that promise was passed on to him. Isaac had some sons, and the promise was passed on to Jacob. And he, he's the one who became, had his name changed to uh, Israel. And we want to be part of those promises and inherit them too. This is where Galatians tells us how we can be a, a part of that and get into them. And so I'm going to cut in at uh, verse 24. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, it is no longer the schoolmaster. For you are the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. As many as you that are, have been baptized into Christ and have put on Christ, where there is neither Jew nor Greek, nor bond nor free, nor male or female, you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promises. And so it kind of links these first principles where the promises that were made unto Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, you know, these are links that you have to put together. And that link, when we tell from the disciples, is pinned to the Lord Jesus Christ and his return. And so his return, when he returns and sets up the kingdom of Israel, that's when the, all those things will start to be fulfilled. And the ultimate, and will continue to be, uh, continually be fulfilled until they're completely fulfilled. That's from far as the word is saying, once that happens, it's all straight sailing to the kingdom of God at that, at, at that end. And so we have uh, all this uh, stuff coming, uh, coming together. Now, one of the uh, prophecies, just to uh, put uh, a place in to be, and I don't want to spend too much time there, is in Zechariah chapter 14. There are many unfulfilled prophecies concerning the, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and events that have yet to happen, and they're going to happen around the, the land of Israel, and in particular, Jerusalem. Now, in Zechariah 14, it's going to tell us of the stuff that when, when Christ will return with the saints. And it's as clear as day that that's what he's talking about. Now, I don't know if you got any headings at the top of your Bible. At the top of my Bible, it says, Christ is coming and the kingdom. Sometimes those are a little, a little funky. And then even the, uh, the, the header for chapter 14, it says, The destroyers of Jerusalem destroyed, and the coming of Christ, and the graces of his kingdom, and the plague against Jerusalem's enemies, and the remnant shall not shall turn to the Lord, and their spoils shall be holy. Sometimes those chapters are a little bit much, but that's not bad <laughs> considering what's going on there. And I have this other one right here. It's the last siege of Jerusalem. There have been uh, two main uh, sieges of Jerusalem. This is the third and last siege, siege of Jerusalem, also known as Armageddon, right? Also known as Armageddon. This is the start of Armageddon. And so let's read the first few verses of Zechariah chapter 14. And so behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and the spoil shall be divided amidst thee. So there's going to be some judgment going on. He says, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the woman's ravished, and the half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. 
And so it's, <coughs> excuse me. Thank you, Ray, for the water. I knew I was gonna get there. And so there's a, quite a bit of information there that you would that you would see that happens if we can get the sequence right before anyone sees the Lord Jesus Christ, or they, as far as we know so far, right? This thing's got to start to happen, or he's, Lord, he's made himself known. These are going to come by the way the sequence is. See a little scowl there from one or two, but it's all right. So Jerusalem is going to be taken. And in order for Jerusalem to be taken, as we'll see in Ezekiel chapter 38, parts of the land will have to be taken. In particular, it calls the mountains of Israel. Nobody gets to Jerusalem without you know, a fight. And if in the clickbait thing, if you think the Ukrainians are fighting, <laughs> try to get into Israel. Just to let that sink in for a moment. About that. If you think that the Ukrainians are fighting for their land, how do you think the Israelites are going to fight for their land? They will use everything they have and anything they can get their hands on. That's, that's how the, uh, I would think that this is going to be uh, uh, devastating. As it says, half the city will be taken. <clears throat> Excuse me, but there's a residue, which is another way to say a remnant, or we would say a tenth. Now, those are clues, right? We always say there's a remnant, and, uh, and a tenth comes up quite a bit. It even says the tenth in Isaiah, right? And, and a remnant. There's somebody, there's people to be saved. And these, this is the start of what would be the, the people of the kingdom of God. And so this is what's happening. Not everyone is, uh, uh, is destroyed in this battle that we know of. But in verse 4, we have his feet hidden, the Lord Jesus Christ. His feet will, in, the, in that day, on the Mount of Olives, before Jerusalem, on the east side of the Mount of Olives, just in case we didn't know where the Mount of Olives was, was or where Jerusalem was, right? I think the word, where it is. It's on the east. It shall cleave into the midst towards the east and towards the west. And there shall be a very great valley. And half the mountain shall remove towards the north and half towards the south. Now that's incredible. Right? That's what's going to happen there, right? So there's the Mount of Olives is going to split in two. Half of it's going to go one way and half of it's going to go the other way. And somehow Jerusalem is, you know, not destroyed at, at this time, right? So there's a, it's obviously... <coughs> excuse me, uh, God is involved, and then there's some powers being, being put to fry that, but in verse 5, it says, and, and you shall flee from the valley of the mountains, not really knowing what's really going on, going on. and when you reach unto Isaiah, yea, you shall flee, like you, like you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzzah, the king of Judah, and it gives an example, and the Lord God shall come, and the saints with thee, so it's Christ and the saints, and this will be the first really the public part of anyone seeing Christ and the saints. Now, here's what we deal with. This is not the first time that anyone sees Christ, because in order for the saints to be there with Christ, the first principle is there'll be a resurrection, there'll be a judgment. And so uh, if we're going to be like the disciples, right, that are waiting back there, they're Abraham has died and buried. David's died and buried. All the disciples have died and buried. In order for them to see, they're going to see Christ first. They're going to go through a, a, a period of judgment. So they're with Christ first. But this is the way it's introduced to the rest of the world. And this is when they see who, who he is. Or that. And he comes to uh, Jerusalem, uh, Jerusalem and he saves the remnant. He saves the day. And in all the unfulfilled prophecies, this is what they need. It's no other way out. This is the testing that, that we all get. When there's no other way out, we almost, as a people, we almost, oh, oh my God, that's what we, that's what everybody says. And we, you know, we turn to prayer and we know that even the, even the people that said that not practice thing, they almost instinctively go to, oh, and you know, they, they go to the higher power. Well, if you use the word, you will have some knowledge, you'll have some tools you have some uh, uh, parts to help you uh, go through the through the tests of, of triumph of that. So there's just, just some parts of getting to, getting to there. Now, now to our clickbait back in Ezekiel chapters uh, 38 and 39, which is uh, uh, which will be great for us actually 
there's a, um, I can't remember what it is, but it's coming up. Somebody gave me Ezekiel and the dry bones, so I get to do, I get to do a Bible class on uh, Ezekiel 37. So Ezekiel, a lot of chapters of Ezekiel, just so you get an idea, 37, 38, 39, 40, 40, all the way through. There's only one thing that's, that's been fulfilled out of all those, I'll, I'll let the, and the thing that's been fulfilled through all that is that there's Israel as a nation and the Jews are in the land, right? I got to remember that when, is, when Ezekiel uh, spoke this, and for a long time, there was no nation of Israel. And the Jews weren't in the land, right? And so there's a long time went uh, 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 past. Ezekiel was uh, BC 570 something or other. Pick a number, I'll pick the last number, and you can make an argument for two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, something, whatever. 570 something. Well, that's a, a long time ago, right? Two and a half thousand years plus, a little bit. So, um, so this is the things that are happening. One of the things that we want to be able to uh, highlight, which was uh, explained to me when I was trying to figure this out, is that these Latter-day prophecies, and in particular in Ezekiel, you have the Son of Man. Now, who's that? The Son of Man is, he typifies the Lord Jesus Christ. So when he's we're reading from Ezekiel 38, he says, Son of Man, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of Man, look where he gets his direction from back to where we started in second timothy we get our direction from the word right even the lord jesus christ got his direction from the word and from it is from his father and he typifies that it could be that he's even saying that he did say this to ezekiel but ezekiel uh, types the lord jesus christ and he's saying that to him the other part that comes out is this the latter days or latter years and in that day it shall come to pass the time of the end that's not in this particular chapter, but there's some other phrases like the time of Jacob's trouble. These are all, all connected to the same time period. As you can imagine how much stress there will be in the land of Israel when all the nations come in and try to uh, come into Israel and take Jerusalem. And they will fight to their last uh, uh, little bit if they can. Right? So there's a, the, the time of trouble as there never was before. And there's this, uh, uh, as is explained. But in Ezekiel, <clears throat> Ezekiel chapters uh, 38, we have some, he names who they are. It's one of the few places where we get some names of countries that are involved. All the other ones, it says, and all the nations. And you're thinking, all the nations? Like China, Japan, the whole thing, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> all kinds of all every single nation is coming and it's a bit much if you take it that literal all the nations that are typically around, uh, uh, enemies of israel and who have either actually tried to invade israel or uh take the representative of what we would say the kingdom of men and try to take over israel because really what is happening here at the time of zechariah 14 is the start of the end of the kingdom of men and the start of kingdom of god it's the big rock from daniel's chapter two smashing the uh, uh symbol of the kingdom of men it's the start of that that's what that, that that is and this is also this is what ezekiel chapter 38 it's a bit names some of the uh antagonistic countries and it seems to be some major and minor players if you will and so the major players are in the first uh, few verses which we'll we will read verses one two and three and said, and the word of the Lord came unto me, uh, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog in the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach, Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. And so we have all these, uh, thing, and it's, they sound kind of weird, actually, those names. Does anybody know where any of those countries are? Can you, can you uh, go on uh, Google Maps and find Gog and Magog and Tubal and thing? I don't know. I didn't try, but I don't think this. So these are names that Ezekiel, at Ezekiel's time, were where they, uh, uh, where they were uh, from. And in particular, there's the one that we're for tonight is that I have in the King James, it's the chief prince, but uh, the chief is uh, the word, Hebrew word Rosh. And so, the, and, and it's being the uh, Rosh is being identified as Russia. 
you know, and he's like, wow, man, really? That's what you're trying to say? Russia is the one who's involved in here? Like if you're coming from the outside, your first time you ever read this, you're like, that says Russia? Don't take my word for it. I'm an old private interpretation. Take any biblical lexicon you like. Take any biblical dictionary you like, any uh, historians of the time, Josephus, uh, Gibbon, the rise and fall of uh, the Roman Empire, uh, Samuel Bocart. There's, a few, like, there's just so many other uh, ones that have written about this. And I kept, I didn't bring my whole library, but I did bring one. So I'll look at uh, Gesenius. You know, the uh, Bible lexicon, Gesenius is, is one that's uh, used extensively. And it's even kind of funny because he, the Bible lexicons go by whoever's editing it. You know, like Gesenius didn't write down all these stuff, but even after Gesenius, you sometimes use uh, Brown, Driver, and Briggs. They took Gesenius and re redid it, and now it's called their name, right? And all the Bible dictionaries are kind of like that as well. So there's Easton's, Smith's. Smith was huge. Smith's now is like this, but in the, originally it was three big honking and it had everything in there, right? Anyway, so from Gesenius uh, lexicon, looking at uh, Rosh, which uh, is uh, Hebrew 7, if it's Strong's numbers, 7220, if you want to look that up, it says in Ezekiel 38, verse 2, verse 9, and in verse uh, chapter 39, and in verse 1, it's a proper noun of the northern nation mentioned with Tubal and Meshach, undoubtedly the Russians, who are mentioned by the Byzantine uh, writers of the 10th century. So he's quoting somebody else or that. Says, Under the name, and he uses Greek there, dwelling north of the, uh, I can't read Greek that well. <coughs> Excuse me. And under the name of Tars in the Arab and described by uh, a couple of, this guy named Flossen, an Arab writer by the same age and dwelling on the river uh he says rye but then it's uh Bolola, which is you can find that instead of the w use a v that's in uh russia and also i mean the other uh one is it? the other other um river is in turkey and so these are the nations that you would uh be able to identify and if you have a any kind of maps in your Bible, you probably can see some of that stuff, right? With that. If you go there, it doesn't have to be long. Most Bibles have some maps in them. And when you uh, find the right one, if you're using the uh, Oxford maps, you will find, uh, what is it? It's map five. And the Oxford maps are in lots of other uh, uh, Bibles as well. You know that, but you find map. basically what it ends up being there's a this uh, they found this river that goes through Turkey it ends up being a, a Istanbul or Constantinople, and the other rivers above the uh, Black Sea. These are the people that lived in that area, and they even uh, in particular uh, went up through what was known as the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. You can picture that in your mind. You can use your maps. This is when PowerPoint would be great, right? This is when to get to that. But you can have to look at this yourself. Don't take my word for it. You gotta, you gotta, you, gotta, you know, get in there with it. The people that were from there, they moved on. They end up being uh, uh, moved on it uh, north from there and uh, to uh, the west. And the names end up being uh, Tobolsky, Moscow, and uh, I think those are just they end up being. That's the names I think in the cities where they stopped. That's how they. They rhyme. They all have this uh, Russian uh, connection, and they fulfill, <clears throat> excuse me, other parts of that type, being what we would call the head of the kingdom of men, all the way back from the Babylonian days or even Nimrod days to Babylon to the head of the kingdom of men, shown up being even the king of of the north from out of uh, Daniel, and so this is where those uh, nations are spoken of and get some identity to go through. Now there's some other minor players back in Ezekiel chapter 38. These are the uh, major players, if you will. The minor players are mentioned in verses um, uh, five and six. So he's spoken of, he identifies those and he says, I, verse four, I will turn thee back. I will put hooks into your jaws 
and I will bring thee forth all thine army, thy horses, thy horsemen, thy clothes with all sorts of armor and a great company with bucklers and shields uh, and all them that are handling uh, swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya, and all them that, that uh, with a shield and a helmet, and Gomer and all his bands, and even the house of Tagomer, and all the northern parts with all his bands, and many people with thee. So there's this conglomerate of nations, for the, is Russian, Russia and their confederates, uh, uh, Turkey is Tagarma, uh, Gomer, as I think, is people that had moved uh, from the north and moved farther to the west. It's going to more towards uh, Austria and Germany. I think uh, Persia is Iran. Ethiopia is uh, Kush. And so it's all the uh, Kushites, which would be uh, modern day Jordan or some along that lines. And then you have Libya and other things. So you have some that are they're major players and minor players. And then they're come, these were the only time that any particular nations are actually named that will actually come in at the time. And so what do you uh, get from, you have from uh, these countries being identified, which is a lot to take in, but now we use our little uh, cheat uh, phrases that I gave you, uh, the latter years and in that day, you look at verse eight then, because there's a lot of verses in chapter thir Ezekiel 38 and 39, but if you look at Ezekiel 38, verse eight, and after many days, thou shalt be visited in the latter years and thou shalt come unto the land which was brought back from the sword and gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel. And you have always been a waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations and they shall dwell safely in there. And so this is a, a, a long time within, but it's the start of the time of the end. It's the latter days. And the time of the end is the end of the kingdom of men. That's the end of the thing. It's not that the end of the world is going to blow up and die and everything. What I think it's the end of the kingdom of men and the start of the kingdom of God in, in on earth. And then it says in verse 10, and thus saith the Lord God that thou shalt it shall come to pass at the same time that the uh, time shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought, and thou shalt say, I will go up into the land of unwell villages, I will go unto them that are at rest, that dwell safely all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. And I will take a spoil and I will take a prey and I will turn my hand upon them in the desolate places and all the in, uh, inhabited and upon all the people that have gathered out of all nations, which have gotten cattle and goods and all the midst of, in the midst of the land. And so there's these other, so I'm going to come and take that stuff. That's what's happening in, Ze in Zechariah 14 and in other places. And I've, I, I know it's in Micah chapter four, it's in Joel chapter three, it's in Zephaniah chapter three. It's a, these are, it's a lot to take in, but this is the, of, of when they would uh, come in. So this is the, the time period and he's gonna come and uh, take of the land and, and go after it. And so there's some other uh, countries that are I think, asking what's sort of what's going on. That's verse 13. Sheba, Dedan, and the merchants of Tyre, all the long lines are thereof. And they sort of put uh, this conglomerate into check and asked them a question. Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey? As a, a, a carry away silver and gold and to take cattle and goods and take a great spoil? <coughs> I would say that that takes some time. Even as we're saying now that we're, the, the world is accusing uh, Russia of taking all the wheat. It's going to be this great famine, right? Where they're stealing all the wheat, even though the wheat's going to somebody, right? For that, I'd say the only time there'd really be a, a, a famine is if they failed to plant the wheat the next year, or then in my mind, but I think they're, they're using the wheat, right? So it's being distributed, but they got to steal it. If they, well, we look at it as them stealing because it's not theirs. This is what's happening. That takes time. And then to have other countries say, are you really doing this? Like, what's going on? That that will take some time. And so um, then will come the end. Verse 14, son of man, say unto Gog, thus saith the Lord God, in that day when my people dwell safely, will thou not know it? And in verse uh, 16, and thou shalt come up against my people Israel in the cloud over the land, and it shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against the land that the heathen may know me. And then I will... 
I will be sanctified in thee, O Gog, in their eyes. And so it's the, uh, God is saying that he will have his Christ and the saints will defeat Gog and if Gog's the, uh, Gog, Magog, Meshach, Tubal, the prince, uh, the, uh, the prince, chief prince of Rosh, if you will, all that, that, that's who's doing the fighting. And it shall come to pass, verse 18, at that time, when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, said the Lord God, that my fury shall come up upon his face. For I am jealous, and I am in a fire of wrath, and I have spoken in that day, there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. An earthquake? Will be one of the, not literally they'll be fighting with that, but there'll be the other part is there's going to be this great earthquake. Remember, he said that it's going to be on Mount of Olives, it's going to split one thorp and south. I think there's going to be this uh, uh, great uh, shaking. This is the, uh, uh, they would say, this a part of, of Armageddon. Even in chapter 39, it says that he's going to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, come down. I'm just looking at the highlighted parts. Therefore, son of man would be the, still speaking uh, to him. In verse 8, it says, Behold, it is come, and it is done, said the Lord God. This is the day whereof I have spoken. And he says in verse 11, It shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto Gog a place where the graves in Israel and the valley of the passengers on the east of the sea, and it shall stop the noses of the passengers. So they're saying they're walking by and they're going, Together, what? That's where that's where that's where uh, where they that's where Gog and uh, all his buddies are. He's going to bury them, and it shall be a multitude, and they shall call it the Valley of Haman Gog, which ends up being um, the city of the dead. And verse twelve: Seven months shall the house of Israel bury them, that I may cleanse the land. And it comes up again this uh, Valley of Haman Gog in verse uh, fifteen. And the passengers that pass through the land, they will see a man's bone as it will stick up and, and put a sign on it till the barriers have buried it in the valley of Haman Gog. And so it's the end where all of these people meet their end uh, uh, that are involved with this. And then it says in verse 22, so shall the house of Israel know that I am the Lord and uh, the Lord their God from that day forward. And so this is the, uh, like I said, the start of the kingdom of men and the end, start, the end of the kingdom of men and the start of the kingdom of God. A little bit of Freudian slip there. But this is what we would say, is this a sign? Well, if you see that happening, you are, yes. If you see Russia in Israel, on the mountains of Israel, or the, that's what happened, yes. Christ, that would be a sign of Christ's return and he's not far off. There'll be some, Russia will be, they, they will be in the land uh, taking their prey, taking their spoil, their own thing, and then Christ and the saints will come and uh, save the remnant. That's how, that's what way that, uh, the way that, that goes. So if we were to see that, yes, but I think that if we're successful in our gospel proclamation, that you will be part of the saints and that we will be with Christ and that the resurrection would happen before that in order to be with Christ and follow him wherever he goes. Just some logical step points. How long that is, I don't know for sure. I have some ideas. But, uh, but we would be with him. And so that we don't necessarily need to see Russia in the land. But this, what's happening now, is a type of how that, how that aggression goes. They get drawn into the, oh, I think, and Russia has even from uh, the old days, what they want, even what their uh, goals were from both world wars, is that we will take the word from Moscow or Russia straight down south, is what they told them, between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea and straight down. And they said, that's, they said, we will handle that the last time they were there in the world war with their alloys. This is an area that we will go and conquer. That was their assignment. Well, that, that's uh, publicly known. There's a, a Martin Gilbert that has it on, on the maps that that sort of thing. There's some other historians that talk about this with, with the allies. So 
Russia's aggression, a sign of Christ's return. If, you were, if we were to be around and seeing uh, them knocking at the door and coming into the land, I'd say absolutely yes. Is it the mean that we, Christ won't be here yet? So you say, well, I'm not going to worry about Christ being here yet until I see Russia in the land. Right? Like, well, I don't have to, I'll, I'll get my act together then, right? That's what, that's what we're like. I said, no, you can't do that. Or they, in order to be you know, perfect, uh, thoroughly furnished as a man of God, you have to be prepared before that. And in all likelihood, I, I suggest to you that if you get on that, on that path, that you won't see Russia coming into a thing, that you'll be part of the uh, Christ and God's army uh, defeating the kingdom of men in Jerusalem. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Dean. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments? Brother Dean, before we close off, Was there, are we going to have a mic at the back as well, or maybe? Maybe. I love the question period. Actually, I know I'm crazy. Paul. It's an excellent question, Paul. I, I, right from the time of that, that uh, you know, first learning on the word, and you're going to think, it says, yes, we've been discussing this since, since as long as I've known been been part of the community, is you know, you know, Israel dwelling safety, and they're you know they're not really safe. Everybody's trying to get them, and we've even had you know many skirmishes since 1948, even before that, and even now, if you were to actually count acts of aggression and terrorism, Israel is not a place you want. You know, they have it, have it all the time. But uh, so it's a bit of a tough one, and people get a, um, you probably know, you wrangle at what the meaning of the word is, and you know, does it doesn't really mean safety. It has some idea of that, obviously, it gets translated that. But on a secular side, let's say, the Jews feel pretty secure 